Welcome on in, golf fans. It's your boy, G.S. Luke, here with our course breakdown for this week's Genesis Invitational. We've got Riviera Country Club, one of the more iconic venues on the entire schedule. we got Tiger Woods teeing it up, a signature event, a cut this time around, which is maybe a little bit different compared to the other signature events, but a top-level field, a top-level course, which will be a star of its own this weekend, and a lot of props and DFS that we're going to get after later this week. So here in this course preview, going to make sure you have all the information that you need to go out there, get your research process started, whether it's over there for props, DFS outrights, and make some of your top end selections. We'll start with just some details around Riviera afterwards, a little hole by hole breakdown. And then towards the end of this video, I look at some of the key stats that I'm using in my models, as well as a few of the comp courses around the PGA Tour that you can use for some of your corollary analysis. So a lot to get into here. Riviera, a course that we can talk about for hours if we wanted to. Let's go ahead and get this thing started. Riviera Country Club is one of the tougher tests that we're going to see on the entire PGA Tour schedule. And it's not really one facet of the game that's going to go out there and challenge these players. It is a sum of all four parts. You're off the tee. You got to move it in both directions. Your approach shots, you've got to be extremely precise or else you're going to have some pretty tough up and downs around the green. Roll tough there, especially because of how tricky the greens are. And with all that slope, how fast it runs out there in LA, you also have some really tough putting to deal with. So You'll see a scoring average over par most years. Um, there was one year out of the last five where it played slightly under par. And normally a winning score that doesn't get even close to 20 under. I think last year's winner of about 17 under par with John Rahm is about as good as you're going to see. Now, I say typically there because this year we have just about the perfect type of scoring conditions, um, especially with the signature type of field. You're going to see a lot of guys go low this year. The main reason for that would be the rain that LA has gotten over the last two, three weeks. That impacted the Pebble Beach Golf Tournament. Heck, even the farmer's rate was a lot softer than what we're used to seeing. In LA, not all that far from both of those venues, um, also got a lot of that moisture. So you're going to be dealing with softer fairways, which are normally really tough to hit with how firm and fast they run. And then the greens, they're large, right? They're 7,500 square foot, but they typically play a lot smaller than that because of how firm and fast they are and because of the slopes and the way that you can end up rolling off the green a lot of times. This year, it's going to play longer. So this 7,300 yards is probably going to play at least 200 yards longer, but it's going to be a lot easier to hit the greens. So it's going to play a little bit differently than what I think we're used to here. And in terms of your scoring conditions, I do think you're going to see an under par scoring average. So that's not something that we see very often at this golf course, but the main defense here is design, right? Having to shape the ball in both directions and then how firm and fast this course plays. In terms of other things to keep an eye on, you've got Kakuya rough this week, which if you're playing a drinking game, trying to follow along with the broadcast, um, just take a drink every time they say Kakuya. It's going to be said um, more than probably 20, 30 times this week. So be careful out there, but uh, that's definitely something you can look at. Like I mentioned, everything around this course is slightly harder than what you're used to seeing. So your fairway percentage, green and regulation percentage, both slightly harder than tour average there. You can see right about a 10% difference with fairway percentage um, out there compared to the tour average. Um, and these are over the last three years. So these are a sum, right, an average over the last three years. And you can see green and regulation percentage, we got at 56%. That's about 9% lower, almost 10% lower compared to your tour average there. Your scrambling rate, about 5% higher than tour average. That's actually a little bit surprising. You'd think that'd be a little bit lower, but almost every other metric that you look at, um, you're going to see a lot of difficulty out here. Whether it's three putt percentage, a little bit higher than what you're used to seeing. Birdies, lower than your PGA Tour average. Bogey percentage, higher than what you're used to seeing. Uh, again, it's not one category. We're going to see all these players tested. It's across the board, right? Everything around the Riviera Country Club is going to be difficult. I um, mean, you see that with your winners, right? It's a lot of guys that pop at major championships. It's a lot of players that don't get themselves into trouble. And if we look at the top four last year, there's no better example of this. John Rahm, Max Homa, Patrick Cantley, Will Zalatoris. Guys in a John Rahm, Cantley, and Zalatoris that have also been pretty good around Augusta National. So not to give away too many of our comps here, uh, but we'll definitely have to talk about Augusta National later on. We go back to the year before that, right, when Joaquin Neiman won. You had Neiman, Morikawa, Cam Young, Hovland, Adam Scott, JT. Um, you get down here to Matt McNeely, right? That's your first suspect ball striker, but your top six there, 
all elite level ball strikers, right? I'm not talking, you know, top 20 type of guys, even Joaquin Neiman, right? Routinely in the top 10 of shots gained ball striking when he was out there on the PGA Tour. So there's another example of the cream rising to the top. You go back there to 2021, you've got Homa, Finau, Burns, Cam Smith, right? Another one of the suspect ball strikers. But I mean, majority of this leaderboard are guys that just stripe it, right? And the strength of field dictates that to a lot of your top end players, um, especially now that it's a signature event, of course, are going to play at Riviera. But the leaderboards speak for themselves. I mean, Rom, Hovland, Fitzpatrick, Burns, Finau, Homa are all the top level ball strikers in the game. And you pretty much see that every single year. Partly due to the difficulty, partly due to the fact that you have to have a complete game to compete around a Riviera Country Club, but all of that adds up to a pretty epic week of scoring. So our key stats, we're not really going to be focusing on one thing over the other this week. It's a pretty balanced portfolio, but the one thing I will say is that this year off the tee, I think is going to be a lot more important than past years. We're going to go hole by hole here in just a minute, show you guys some of the shots that they're facing, but with wet conditions, you're not going to get nearly as much rollout, right? Distance. I think is going to be a huge asset here in 2024. And on top of that, if you have these soft greens, hitting out of the fairway is going to give you all that spin control that you're looking for. And there's been about a week since the last rain out there in LA. It might get slightly firmer as the week goes on. Hitting out of the fairway is going to be a massive advantage um, out there with those soft conditions. So if there's lift clean in place, add even more emphasis to the accuracy. But I think off the tee success, which was already extremely important around the Genesis, is I think going to be even more crucial here in 2024. So once again, we'll talk more about the key stats when we get to that section of the video but this year maybe you're going to have a slightly different um, thought process than what we've had in past years because of some of that recent weather Riviera is a course that we've seen so many times in the past that most people are really familiar with what we're going to see here. So we don't spend that much time out here with our analysis. So first off, hole number one is as easy as it's going to get around the Genesis Invitational. It's a 500-yard par 5 that plays slightly um, downhill off the tee. In fact, it's like a 40-yard drop, so I think slightly would be a little bit underwhelming. And you're going to have guys that drive it out here near this cart path. In fact, some that maybe even get it slightly past the cart path at years where it's a little bit firmer and faster. Now with the soft conditions, you probably don't see those mammoth drives this time, but even a mediocre 284 yard drive only leaves you 230 yards in and hitting it 284 would probably be an iron for a lot of these players because of that downhill aspect so look for guys to make a lot of eagles a ton of birdies around hole number one and unless it's in this bottom right pocket um, which you can see is a small little corridor over here um, it's just going to be a birdies galore now this bottom right pin location is a little bit tricky and in fact you actually see bogeys to that kind of pin location uh, but the rest of the green is extremely extremely gettable. Hole two is your hardest hole. So hole number one, your easiest. Hole two, they go ahead and slap you over the head after you make a birdie. They've got out of bounds to the left on the driving range. You've got eucalyptus trees down the right, um, which will force a lot of layups. And there's a ton of slope to the right of the screen. You can't really get full perspective um, because of the fact that these are satellite images. But this right bank over here is about a 40 degree slope. So anything that you miss to the right of the green will funnel down onto the putting surface, which makes these right pin locations actually a better opportunity for birdie than many would expect but if you end up missing the green to the right let's say over here in this longer rough slash natural area um, well you, then you have an impossible up and down right to those right side pin locations so it's a uh, the hardest hole in the course right it's over 500 yards actually longer than what you had in hole number one plays even longer too because you don't have that downhill aspect uh just an absolute brute Hole number three, you've got a medium length par four. Um, this bunker out here is completely meaningless um, and won't trip up any players. But the second shot here is not as easy as it looks from the overhead view. Um, it's about 140, maybe 130 yards for some of your shorter players. And depending on the pin location, there are a lot of nasty spots to get up and down out of. If you have a front right pin location, this bunker is about five, six yards deep. Um, so you can hardly even see the pin when you're down in that bunker. Um, and then over here to the left side, side, you've got some real difficult shots from over the screen. So every hole here is going to have some teeth to it, um, even the holes that look a little bit more simple from the overhead view. 
Hole four is one of those holes, right? It's 240 yards. You've got a tiny green. Um, so many would expect this to play slightly over par, but what they don't expect is for this to be one of the harder holes on property. And uh, usually it is. This year with the softer conditions, a lot of that character is going to be taken out of this barricked green. But the issue here um, is everything. It goes from front right to back left. And there is a ton of slope over here on this green. In fact, you can hit shots the whole whole way over here to the right in the fairway, about 20 yards short and about 30, 40 yards to the right. And they will roll the whole way up onto the surface. Now with firm conditions, right, that's what we usually see. With soft conditions, I think you have to make take more of a direct line, right? I think you have to try and actually land it on this green. If we're gonna have dartboards out there, which might make it play slightly easier, actually might make it play slightly harder, right? You're hitting a shorter club over here to the right side. You have more margin for error when you're hitting it over here and using the slope. Whereas if you're trying to get close to one of the pin locations with dart boards, um, you have to do all carry, right? It's a full 240 yard shot. Um, I, it'll be interesting to see how hole number four plays. It'll be a lot different than what we're used to seeing. Hole five is 435. It's another medium length par four. You're kind of forced to lay up because of this natural area in the middle of the fairway. And once again, the shot looks real simple from the overhead view, but depending on the pin location they choose, there are spots of bother. I mean, you've got this bunker, which is pretty short of the green. If you hit it in there, you're gonna have no chance to get up and down. That's a long bunker shot to a green with a ton of undulation. You hit it over the back left of the screen. Well, there's a ton of slope taking it towards the fairway area and those tightly little chips off Kakuya are not as easy as they would be on, let's say, a Bermuda grass. Um, it's a surface that we just don't see very often. Uh, so the chipping, even though you had about a 63.5% scrambling rate, uh, can be a little bit harder for guys that aren't experienced on it. Hole six is 200 yards. Uh, this is what we call the donut green, right? You've got a little um, bunker in the center of the green complex. And uh, this one is an absolute bear, right? If you miss on the wrong side of the bunker, you have to chip over the bunker. There are some slopes you can use to try and put it around the bunker, but, but then you're just leaving a whole lot of room for air. So it's a difficult hole. This back left pin location is probably the easiest and uh, which doesn't seem right. Uh, this front right pin location is also pretty gettable, but a front left pin is especially devilish and a back right pin um, is actually extremely hard. So a lot of that comes down to the slopes on the green over here to the back left you have a ton of slope coming from the back side towards the front so you can actually run shots from the back of the screen back to that moving day pin location and then days one two they normally use this front right pin location for at least one of those rounds you also have a ton of slope over here to the right side of the green uh, where you can spin back shots to that pin location so the back pin locations are really hard because you have a hard time controlling that spin and then over here to the left side Getting it to spin the whole way down this green is hard because if you miss left in this bunker, it's a real difficult up and down. And then anything short is pretty much de dead. It's a real difficult up and down. Hole seven is 412 yards, a medium length par four. Um, very similar to a few of the other medium length par fours that we've had, but don't sleep on these holes. They aren't as easy as what they look. Hole eight is 428. Another example of one of those sneaky difficult holes. This right side natural area um, slash Barranca is extremely difficult to get out of and uh, a large green though there with hole number eight. Nine is 462. So another one of those medium length par fours. So this one requires a slightly longer approach shot and uh, is another one of these awkwardly shaped green complexes where pin location really drives the scoring average. If you have a front middle pin, it can play relatively under par. You have a you know front right pin, that's difficult. A back left pin is of course one of the harder pin locations on this property. It's, uh, it's a hole that comes down to pin location. Hole number 10 is 311. This is the most iconic hole on property. Uh, the donut green is uh, up there, but hole number 10, this drivable par four, is one of the classics in golf. You've got a green complex, which is the most difficult, I think, in the world. Um, everything slopes from right to left and from front to back. So even if you're hitting a wedge into the screen, you have a hard time holding the green complex. Now this year, because it's going to play a lot wetter, I think you're gonna see more players lay up. Um, that's my hot take is this year, because of the fact that you're gonna have dartboards out there, 
I think you're going to see people hit it to this first marker over here and then try and be precise with their wedge. The reason for that is the soft conditions, right? You're going to be able to apply spin to the golf ball. The issue with laying up is that hitting this green from here with firm and fast conditions is like a 50-50 prospect. And if you miss the green with your wedge shot from there, you are screwed, right? I mean, the up and down percentage out of these bunkers is sub 40%. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of people, especially from this front bunker, um, get it close to any front pin location. Um, it's going to be all strategy based based on the pin. So this year, I think when we see this um, middle pin location, so they will put a pin actually close to where this marker is, um, unlike a lot of the other greens on the property um, where they're going to go towards the edges. If they use a, one of these middle pin locations, it would not surprise me to see guys lay up. So that's something to keep an eye on from the strategy perspective. Hole 11 is 580. This is another par five, your second of your round. And it's uh, gettable. It's your second easiest hole in terms of birdie or better percentage. And uh, you can get there in two. There's a lot of slope um, over here to the right side. Uh, so if you miss to the right, and it's like, extremely difficult up and down. But uh, one of the easier holes, obviously, uh, mostly because it's a par five. Hole 12, so pretty much every time they give you a bone, they give you an easy hole, they back it up with an extremely difficult hole. So that's what we get with hole 12, 488, a long par four. And uh, if you miss this fairway, good luck even trying to get it on the green in two, um, let alone trying to make a par. Hole 13 is 464, dog leg from right to left. So this this hole definitely favors a draw. Um, unlike a lot of other tour venues that have a lot of holes that slope in one direction, where you'll see you know a draw favored at one course, a fade favored at another course, um, this course is extremely balanced. So this is a hole where, a, you know, sorry, a fade isn't going to play very well. A draw is going to play extremely well and uh, a difficult long range par four. Next up, we've got a hole number 14. This is actually the third easiest hole on property, 191 yards and an extremely large green. Doesn't look that deep, but it actually plays a little bit deeper um, than you can see here from the overhead look. A lot of slope on it, so it's not an easy to putt by any means, especially from range, but uh, a hole that plays in the top five easiest almost every single year. 15 is a dog leg to the right. So unlike hole number 13 that favored the draw, this is where that fade is going to be extremely valuable. And I'm going to back up to the tee shot here because there's a little bit of strategy involved. This is the hole where Victor Hovland has taken it down the right side, utilized a much larger landing area because this is a par five over here, right? And they give them a little bit more room off the tee. And then the shot into the green, right? You've got this little tree in front of it. That's not going to bother players, right? Now this bunker to the right, you do have to carry it to get into the green, but you're playing into a pretty decent angle. So unless it's a front right pin location or a back right pin location, I would expect more people here in 2024 to utilize this angle. Now, last year, they did put a scoreboard back towards the tee box. They put it in this little clearing right here where players were hitting it through onto the 15th green, I should say fairway over there. Maybe they make this internal out of bounds, right? Maybe they take that completely away from the players, um, or maybe you just see it even more leaned into, right? You see more people taking it down 15, taking that easier route, because the thing they're trying to avoid is missing to the left through the fairway, which is really easy to do on a dog leg, right? To hit it through the dog leg, or they try and cut it over the edge and they don't quite get enough carry. To carry it over this bunker on the right, just to give you guys a little bit of transparency, right? This is the shorter end, right? To hit it over that back left corner, it'd be an even longer carry. It's 304 yards, right? So it plays, um, what is it, slightly downhill. So it actually plays a little bit closer to 299 yards. If this plays into the wind like it normally does, that is far from a for sure prospect. If you can get it over this fairway bunker, you'll be okay out of the rough. Um, actually, it becomes a relatively straightforward hole. But because this is about eight yards deep over here, if you hit it into this stuff, you're going to be looking at a, bo a bogey pretty much at best, and then a double in a lot of cases. 16 is 165 yards. Um, this is actually one of the harder holes on site, which it's kind of hard to imagine with how short it plays, but you also have one of the smaller green complexes. So a lot of missed greens here at number um, 16. If you do hit the surface, though, uh, you're going to have at most like a 20-foot birdie putt just because of how small the green is. 17 is that par 5 that people are playing down. Um, this hole is wide open off the tee. Um, so you do have to worry about this bunker to the right, but even if you hit it in there, right, you're playing up, hitting a wedge in, and you will see players try and go for two occasionally, but because it is a 600-yard hole, um, even playing downwind, you're going to see a lot of layups there at 17. 
And then finally, you've got hole 18, 474, slight dogleg from left to right. So I would say favors the draw, sorry, favors the fade ball flight out there. A draw though, you can totally get away with. There's enough room to hit a draw into that fairway. And you've got the amphitheater type style here. This hill with all the different people sitting on it, it's a great finishing hole because it's set up for entertainment, right? For spectators to be able to see what happens there on the final day of action. Um, so I love it. The green's extremely difficult. It has a ton of slope from back left to front right over here. And if you miss over here on this hill, and if for some reason it doesn't bounce down, which I think you're going to see more this year because of how soft it's playing, um, it is such a hard up and down, right? Any of these left pin locations and you miss left, uh, you're looking at a bogey. I mean, unless you make that 30 footer, 40, 40 footer back for the comeback, uh, you're, you're probably not happy with your whole 18. Now that we've seen the golf course, let's go through some of our key stats for the week and the types of metrics that I'm using to identify my top plays. So first off, let's look at the BTN model. Of course, guys, if you want access to BTN yourselves, check out the link in the description, GS Luke at checkout for a promo code, a little discount there, a little kickback to me, a little win-win situation. But over here in BTN, They've got it very balanced. They've got off the tee on there, approach around the green and putting, a little bit of extra emphasis on some of those mid to long iron shots. You can see down here with this approach bucket. And then with the putting, you're looking at four to 15 feet because of the small greens, all the slope that you have. A lot of your birdie opportunities are there in that four to 15 foot mark. So I like what they're doing there. The one thing that I'll say, and we'll go through some of the categories here in a second, is that off the tee for me is a whole lot more important, right? So they're only really looking at it with 15% in their modeling there. In my modeling, I've got it close to 30, 35% in terms of my weighting. So my model is gonna look a little bit different than what they have over here on BTN, but just to give you an idea of some of the better off the tee players over the last, what is it, the last 40 measured rounds. So given a pretty good sample here, we've got Rory at the top, very expected, Scotty Shuffler, right? I mean, your top three players in the world, right? All crush it off the tee. You've got Kevin Yu, a little surprising there, Aberg, Hovland, um, all guys we'd expect to see at the top of this list. Um, Benny Ann, Cam Young, Corey Connor, Siwoo Kim, and of course, before we left, right, John Rahm was a perennial guy that we saw up here. Guys like Joaquin Neiman, absolute flushers off the tee. A lot of your past champions are showing up on this driving list right off the tee um, in a year where it's going to play softer where I think you're going to see more guys hit fairways your guys that hit it a long way I think get a slight bump in their ratings so Max Homa down there right another guy that's won this golf tournament I'm um, up there in the top 10 of this category um, this year I'm going to lean into this even more than usual going to look at off the tee in terms of total driving right distance and your accuracy but a little added bonus I'm going to put in my modeling is going to be driving distance um, I know it's only 7,300 yards um, over there on the west coast at pretty much at sea level, right? It's slightly above sea level, but not my very much. The wet conditions are going to make this like a 75, 7,600 yard golf course. And that's starting to get to the elite level distance category. So guys like a Rory that um, doesn't really play the best here, right? I mean, four or five years ago, right? Top five finishes are more than okay. But over the last three years, right? His best finish is a top 10, uh, which for Rory McIlroy is far from what he's expected. I like them a lot more this year than really ever before. So I think we've got to treat this golf tournament a little bit differently compared to years past. And you can see, Rory, right, number 31 in the BTN model. I guarantee you when I run my model a little bit later, he's probably going to be top 10 because of this off the tee success. So um, that's just something that I wanted to point it out, you know, from my process, something that I'll be including with my bets in for my outrights, DFS, all that this week. Um, but yeah, those are some of your elite level off the tee players. If we're just going to look at approach, this is over the last 40 rounds. It is obviously going to be important. They've got some of your top level players up here. A lot of guys that you'd expect to see. Scotty Lap in the field at 1.2 shots per round. Hoagie up there, Ryder. You got Morikawa, Glover, all guys that are known for that iron ability. But if you're going to hone in on anything, I do think the long irons are a good place to start. Right, Even on those 400 yard par fours, you're going to have at least like 120 yards in. And if you look at the approach distribution, there are a lot more shots that are coming from 150 yards and up um, compared to your average weeks on tour. In fact, 150 to 175 is about 10% higher than what we're used to seeing. The 175 to 200 is a solid 5% higher compared to your tour average. So there's a lot of good in looking at some of the long iron categories. Charlie Hoffman, of course, 
boosted a lot of these stats with what he did last week over there at TPC Scottsdale. But Scotty showing up once again. So that's a three for three, right? And finishing at the top of the board for Scotty Scheffler. Uh, a crazy good play at a golf course like this. But Patrick Rogers, that's surprising. Tom Hoagie showing up again. Okay, that's, you know, far from a surprise, right? He's one of the best iron players on tour. But JT Poston was not expecting to see that. Denny McCarthy was not expecting to see that. And it kind of makes sense with Denny and with Poston, right? They've gone a lot better of late. They've gone a lot better with the irons. And though it hasn't translated to success for Poston at a lot of these more difficult golf courses, it's probably going to come at some point. And with Denny, it already has, right? Last year at the Memorial, right? Nearly winning that golf tournament at this golf course specifically, had his best finish last year, the T14 finish. But these really elite level short game guys, like a post in McCarthy, right, that around the green and putting um, are almost always going to be in the top 30, maybe 40 on tour in both categories, when they get their long irons going, you know, at a course like this, we're going to have a lot of long irons is where they can separate from the field. So I think if you're looking for sleepers, this long iron category is really good to look at. And just to confirm, that's the last 40 rounds, right, that we're looking at. Um, so yeah, it's the last 40 rounds we're looking at over here with the approach category. Um, a lot of good that you can find here. Harris English, a potential sleeper to take. Sepp Straka, another player that is exceptionally good with the long irons that maybe you didn't expect to see here. JJ Spawn, Ricky Fowler, despite the really shitty form. I mean, look at this, right? Just missed cuts galore. Um, did pretty good at the team event, the Grant Thorne Invitational, uh, but that means next to nothing, right? Little gimmick event that they were doing out there, but still playing well from 160 to 230 yards. That gives me at least a little bit of hope for him on this type of week. Um, a few just names to keep an eye on out there. And then lastly, what I want to look at over here is our putting on what they have the overseed. So it's the last 40 rounds they have on here. Um, they've got it all just coming on to this putty POA overseed. Um, if you want to look at this surface, I think it's going to give you a lot of help. But putting in general this week, I think is important, right? So whether you're looking at the overseed numbers or if you're just looking at shots game putting in general, it's not something that you can leave out of the model. The approach stuff, the off the tee stuff, ball striking matters around here. But this putting with how tricky the greens are, uh, you're going to have a lot of three putts. And for guys that are really shitty with the flat stick, um, that's going to catch up to them. Somebody that stands out. You not only had the elite level approach numbers for Sam Ryder, but now we're seeing them putt really well in these overseeded greens. Not... Um, not somebody I think you should sleep on. At, he's, what, 300 to 1 to win this golf tournament? Um, I think a DFS is an excellent play at $6,000. You've got guys like Sam Burns up here that obviously puts well on the overseed. Um, ben Griffin, not a surprise. Brendan Todd, Taylor Montgomery, just some of your better putters in the world to begin with. But maybe a few guys that pop that we weren't expecting to see. Um, Adam Scott, I guess you would kind of expect that. But Tommy Fleetwood, right? Maybe not the most consistent putter. He you know, has his streaks, will go out there and gain, but gaining about a half a stroke per round. Let's see, Sahit so Thagala on the overseeds, okay. That's kind of expected, though. In terms of guys that are maybe a little bit surprising, Cam Davis gaining about a quarter of a stroke per round. Kevin Yu gaining strokes putting is not typical for somebody that can lose nearly six strokes putting like he did over there at Pebble Beach. Let's see, Kirk Kitayama, not, not really known as a consistent putter, also pretty decent on this overseed here. Um, Taylor Moore, decent on overseed. Uh, all guys that raise their baselines out here on this type of agronomy that you might want to keep an eye on out here for the West Coast swing. And then finally, the last stat we'll look at over here in BTN is around the green, right? With difficult around the green shots, it is going to be important to get up and down this week. Now, it's not the end-all be-all because if you're missing, if you're getting out of position, um, you're probably not the types of players that we want for DraftKings purposes. And with the softer conditions, I think you're going to see more greens hit. So around the green still matters, maybe a little bit less of my model this year than what we had compared to the other years. That combined with slightly less putting emphasis, um, though I'm still looking at putting, I'd say maybe slightly less important because of how soft the greens are. A lot of that's going to go to off the tee, right? So where off the tee might have been lacking a little bit, you know, especially last year, 2023, it's going to be gaining a whole lot of steam from these around the green and putting categories. A few names to keep an eye on. JJ Spawn playing really well around the green. It's kind of surprising for me. He's not always up on this list. Russell Hanley, also pretty good around the green. Like, uh, that's decent. That's good to have in your back pocket, especially when you're a player like Russell Henley that is so good with the ball striking. That's just a pretty decent combo to lean into there. JJ Spawn, same thing, right? He's been pretty good with the approach play. Hasn't translated to a lot of success, right? His best finish over his last five starts has been a T13 finish. But long term, 
is putting down the blueprint of a guy that can pop um, at any given moment. So $6,200 in DraftKings, probably going to be work, you know, worth at least a few looks um, later in the week from that perspective. Let's find a few more around the green poppers. We know Kucher and Spieth are going to be up there. No need to mention them. Jake Knapp, look at this, right? He's number 53 in the model ranking over here, but we know he's super long off the tee, which I love for the shots gained off the tee. Um, you can see he's losing to the field here, but he, what, gained two and a half strokes at the Farmers, slightly lost last week at Phoenix because of a few water balls. Potentially worth a few looks there. Really good around the green and the putting on this overseed of non-existent. So we don't have an idea of how he's going to put out here. But last week gained about three strokes putting. Week before that, a stroke and a half. Seems like a pretty decent putter. He seems like a, a guy who's long off the tee. He's pretty decent with the approach by and then around the green is gaining. I mean, he looks like he doesn't have much of a weakness out there. He's what? We're not even in the DraftKings pricing right now, or at least not loaded on here over to bet the number. I like that for Jake Knapp. In fact, I hope that people are taking a nap on him in terms of their DFS lineups. A few of the stats I would look at this week is I would look at scoring in soft conditions. So if you can find a filter, go out there and sort by preferred lies rounds, there's a chance that we get that this week. If so, you might want to consider that for some of your modeling and then birdie your better percentage. This is especially important when we're playing over there from the fantasy perspective taking advantage of guys that gain to the field with birdies with a birdie average of just about three and a half per round guys that can go out there and get five six birdie rounds are going to gain a ton of fantasy points to the field in fact you might have somebody that finishes like 25th this week which is not impressive in a field of this size that still is one of the top 10 fantasy scorers because of the fact that he makes a lot more birdies than the rest of the field. So this is more so important from the fantasy perspective. It still helps you out, obviously, out there from the outright perspective, um, being able to get to some of those ceiling performances, which you need for a win, but for fantasy is absolute gold. So with the softer conditions, I don't think a lot of people are going to be looking at stats like birdie or better percentage, but you're going to see a whole lot more of them here in 2024. And I think leaning into that is a pretty bright idea out there for some of your exposure. And now for some of our comps. I already mentioned the Masters towards the beginning of this video, and it's a pretty good comp for what we're going to get this week. It's a course that is extremely difficult on the greens, also around the greens, and has a relatively balanced approach portfolio. If we look at the birdies and bogeys per round, they're also relatively consistent compared to what we get at this type of track. And some of your past champions are also players that have shown up over there at the Genesis. I mean, John Rahm, an obvious example. Joaquin Neiman doesn't have a massive sample at the Masters, but it's been okay in a few of his starts. Max Homa, decent, right? A lot of those live guys that have played well at the Masters and at the Genesis um, are great examples of a lot of that crossover. You've got Adam Scott, Bubba Watson, right? Who I think is maybe the best example of some of the crossover out there. Uh, a lot of that comes down to the shot shaping, a lot of holes that go in both directions. You have to have a complete game to have any sort of a chance out there at the Masters tournament. And of course, the field strengths are also extremely consistent, right? I mean, it's a major championship type of field being put against a signature event. So if you're going to look at some of the past success, which uh, it doesn't look like they have that loaded in here to BTN, probably because of the licensing rights um, out there with the Masters, um, just something to take a look at. So in terms of some of your averages, right, scrambling, I'd say maybe a little bit harder around the Masters tournament. Um, so a little bit more emphasis there than what you're going to get for a week like this. But most of the other stats that we're looking at are extremely consistent for that week. Next up, we've got the Memorial Tournament. So let me go ahead and find that. It's a little bit later in the year. So let's find that the Memorial presented by Workday. And this course is a little bit more of a bear off the tee, right? You've got longer rough. It's like three, four inches as opposed to the two inch Kikuya rough that we have this week. But it plays to a similar difficulty. When you miss in that Kikuya, it plays a lot longer than the two inches that it's cut at. And if you look at some of these averages, the ferry percentage, maybe not as spot on, right? It's a little bit off, but a low green and regulation percentage, that is spot on, right? 55% scrambling rate, um, slightly harder than your tour average. And then birdies per round, only 3.27, right? Bogeys per round over your tour average at 3.35 per round. Um, these are almost eerily consistent, right? They're almost spot on with what we're going to have at this type of golf course. The green and regulations are harder to hit because of how penal the rough is, also how firm and fast the greens tend to play, which is usually the case of what we get for this golf tournament, right? It's normally very firm and fast, the fairways and the greens. This year, not so much, but again, the leaderboard, cross the leaderboard crossover is eerie. I mean, Scotty Scheffler, Victor Hovland, ball striker showing up. Denny McCarthy, right? This is that near win I was talking about before. His long irons 
have played well at the Memorial before, and because I expect this to be a pretty good comp of what we're going to get this week, is why I think he's potentially a sleeper play to look at. Siwoo Kim played well. Not somebody that was showing up a whole lot when we were looking at our key stats, but finished top four and is playing well right now. So I think maybe even a potential sleeper. I mean, look at this, right? He's had all these made cuts. The ball striking stats have been pretty solid too, right? Shots gained T to green. He's been a gainer in all but two events over his last 10 starts. A name to potentially keep an eye on. Let's look at a few other guys on the leaderboard out there for Memorial. Give this a second to load here. Jordan Spieth, Adam Shank. Okay, that's a name that we haven't seen come up often. Let's look the year before that. So we got Aaron Wise showing up. He's not playing, of course. Daniel Berger. Okay, right, coming back from his injury. Uh, maybe worth a few looks. Denny McCarthy, again. Sahith the Gala, Will Zalatoris, again, right? He showed up this golf course quite a bit over the last two seasons. Um, just a lot of crossover. And a lot of that's because of the field strength, right? A lot of your top end players are playing over there at the Memorial, but it's the same ones that are showing up. The last comp we've got is going to be for the Texas Houston Open. So it's the Memorial Park Golf Course. It's a green complex that has been compared to what you have at Augusta National. A lot of slope out there, real fast, difficult greens to get up and down on. So you can see slightly harder than your tour average from scrambling rate. Your three putt percentage is actually right about tour average, which kind of surprises me out there. But once again, your ball striking stats are slightly harder about across both two categories. Your birdies per round is even lower than what you have this week at right just two. 2.94 per round over the last three seasons and your bogey average also slightly higher than what you have at this golf course so just like the last two venues we looked at a lot of similarities between the types of you know stats that we're seeing from players on average here and then a lot of your ball strikers showing up now this field not nearly as strong as what we're going to get for all of those other golf tournaments we were looking at but a lot of ball strikers showing up right so tony finau winning right and then a lot of scrubs here so it's kind of hard to parse this data but guys like a trey molinax right long also also pretty decent with the approach. Alex Smalley, an absolute flusher with the iron. Same thing for Adam Hadman, Aaron Rye out there. Go back to the season before that. Jason Kokrak won, right? Scotty Shuffler out there in second place. Nothing needs to be said there, right? We know what kind of ball striker he is. Joel Damon up there, Sam Burns. Go to the year before that. We had Carlos Ortiz winning. Maybe not the best ball striker, right? But DJ, Hideki, Taylor Gooch, Brooks, right? All guys that are elite level ball strikers um, that are all showing up at this golf tournament. So in terms of your field strength, I don't think this is the best comp, but what I do like about it is it lets us research some of our value plays, right? Because it's not as strong a field, if we can find guys that were popping in this weaker field event, maybe we can find some 6, 7K plays for some of our DraftKings lineups or some top 10, top 20 bets out there from the outright market. So guys to keep an eye on out here, Alex Smalley, I believe he's in the field. If not, um, that sucks, but if he is in the field, that's great. Adam Hadman, I 99% sure is playing this week. Like him with that T7. Aaron Rye, same thing. If he's teeing it up, probably worth a few looks. Keith Mitchell played well at the Genesis last year and has played well at this comp course. So I think that's intriguing. Justin Rose, of course, um, not a super cheap play, but they're in the 7K range, probably worth a few looks himself. Back there two years ago, in terms of value plays, Joel Damon's probably not teeing it up. So that would have been a decent value. But like Russell Henley, right? Down there in like the 7K range. You got guys, guys, Luke List, right? He's a really good ball striker. Probably worth a look down there in the 6, 7K range. Back there in 2020, you have value plays down here like a Sepp Straka, right? A little bit more expensive this time around than he was back there in 2020. But a guy that you can count on for a little bit of salary savings. Sam Burns showing up again. He's uh, got a lot of good course history around Memorial Park. Terrell Han, Jason Day, Mackenzie Hughes. Maybe worth a few looks um, out there in this signature type of field. Um, this kind of field strength gives us a better look at some of the guys down the board, right? I mean, when we're looking at the Masters, we're looking at some of the harder venues, you know, signature event like we have at Memorial. You're not going to see a lot of these types of players popping. So gives us a little bit of better, a better way to look at some of those bottom tier players. It is another course that's going to play eerily similar to what we're going to have for this golf tournament. That is all I've got for the course breakdown this week. I appreciate the support here, guys. Go ahead, smash that like button for me if you haven't already. And also go ahead and comment down below what you've got as this week's winning score. If you want access to my Patreon, of course, that's where I post all my projections, modeling, all my player pull out there for DFS, props over there for sites like Underdog and Prize Picks. Well, go ahead and give me your guess for the winning score down below. If you end up getting that right, go ahead and get a free month of my Patreon page to go ahead and try out all of those tools for yourself. So go ahead, give me your thoughts down below, and let's have ourselves a week 
out here for this golf tournament. It's a sick golf course, high level field, as we've talked about like 10 times already. Let's take advantage. Let's have some fun with it. And now that football season's over, really get into those golf streets. I appreciate the support. Like I said before, best luck with all of your exposure, whether it's for DFS, outrights, props, and let's have a week over here at the Genesis. Mm -hmm.